はい。それでは時間になりましたので、えっ、ー、と、始めたいと思います。アダム・ワルツキさんによるオックスを用いたダイレクトスタイルスカラです。どうぞ。Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, thank you very much for coming.、Um, my name is Adam Warski. I work at Software Mill. I come from Warsaw, Poland.、Um, and I would like to share some of the work that we've been doing around Direct Style Scala,、uh, how it might be used today、um, with, the, with our OX library.、Um, so, our goal is to propose a programming style、uh, that is both safe and approachable. And if we succeed in any of that, you can judge for yourself in the next 20 minutes. So, the, the motto、uh, of OX、uh, is to provide safe, direct style concurrency and resiliency for Scala on the JVM. So, let's break down what we mean here、uh, um, case by case. So, first of all, we want to be safe. So,、uh, On one hand, this means type safety. Scala is a very type safe language. So we want to leverage、uh, this type safety in a reasonable way.、Um, so, nothing、uh, overly complex,、uh, but、uh, something that allows us to be better、uh, than other libraries, than other frameworks out, the, out, out there, and something that allows to be better than other languages, right? We need to uh, add uh, to add some value.、Um, On the other hand, we also want to be safe when it comes to thread usage.、Uh, so, we want to、uh, provide a solution which allows you to avoid deadlocks,、uh, to avoid race conditions, or resource leaks.、Um, so, finally, we, want, we also want to propose a solution for error handling. So, this safety boils down to static typing,、uh, concurrency, and errors. So, then we've got a direct style. So, some people say that direct style、uh, means simply imperative programming, although I don't think it's such a clear cut definition.、Um, I think you can still do imperative programming in the functional, in the purely functional approach. So, instead, I would say that direct style is an approach、uh, to programming、uh, which leverages the built in control flow constructs in the base language, so in our case, Scala, as the basic. Uh, building blocks for effectful code. And effectful code is usually the code that is the hardest、uh, to write. The wider goal of, a whole,、uh, of, of the project is to enable teams to deliver working software,、um, meaning that the learning curve shouldn't be too steep,、uh, with confidence. Uh, and this refers to the safety that we've talked、uh, before. So, OX is just one project in this area. There's also STTP, Tapir, that also support direct style. There's the Gears project, which is a similar library to, Tap,、uh, to OX,、uh, but making a slightly different design choices that is developed at、uh, EPFL. And finally, there's many Scala and Java libraries out there which actually do support direct style、uh, for a long time. So, then we've got concurrency and resiliency. So, when it comes、uh, Uh, so,、uh, in OX, what this means is that we want, on one hand, to provide high level、uh, concurrence operators, which allow you to avoid explicit concurrence whenever possible.、Uh, but when this is not enough, we also want to provide low level safe building blocks um, and uh, uh, as a way to communicate between,、uh, between concurrently running、uh, threads of execution,、uh, we also want to provide channels. So, channels are modeled after a very similar. Uh, abstraction or data structure in Go. Go isn't the most sophisticated language out there, right? It has rather basic programming constructs. But I think one thing that it actually、uh, succeeded in and brought our attention to is that、um, modeling concurrency and communicating processes using channels actually works very well. So we want to take inspiration from that. And finally, we want to provide some utilities、uh, which are useful in everyday programming, such as retries, rate limiters, and so on.、Um, finally, we've got a focus、uh, on Scala and JVM. Um, so,、uh, JVM, because we want to leverage virtual threads,、uh, we had a great introduction to virtual threads、uh, yesterday. Uh, so,、uh, they, they've been introduced in Java 21.、Um, this also means that we want to leverage the built in asynchronous runtime that is inside the JVM right now. So, before, if we wanted to do asynchronous computing at scale, 
what we needed to do is we needed to use one of the excellent libraries that are out there, such as Cast Effect or Zio. So now the asynchronous runtime is no longer needs to be implemented as a library. It is directly in the JVM. So we want to use to use that. This also means that we cannot really target JavaScript uh, because that's all, it uh, simply doesn't have the required uh, capabilities at the platform level. Uh, we are not uh, we are not able yet to target native, but this might change in the future because native actually introduces some features which might make it. Uh, possible. And finally, we want to use Scala and Scala 3 with all of its uh, great features. So all the new types, context functions, opaque types, enums, as well as principled metaprogramming, so uh, macros and inlines. Okay, so that's the scope of Ox. Uh, let's take a look at some specific code examples uh, so that you can feel how working with this, with this style feels in practice. So here we've got an example of a high-level concurrency operator, PAR. So we've got two computations, computation one, computation two. They sleep for uh, some time, and then they produce a result. So using the PAR method, we can, we, can, we can actually run these two computations in parallel. The PAR method it takes care of all the thread management. It takes care of, it takes care of all the error handling. Um, so if one branch fails, the other one will be interrupted, but the PAR method will wait that until both threads finish, uh, actually, mm, uh, so that there are no uh, thread leaks. In a very similar way, we have a race method, uh, which allows you to race the computations, right? So uh, mm, whichever computation finishes first, this is the result of our uh, race. The other one, again, will be interrupted. And once again, the method will finish only when both branches, both the winning one and the interrupted one, finish, right? So that we get no thread uh, leaks. However, such, and there's a couple more of such high level concurrency operators. However, they are not always enough. So when this built-in concurrency is not enough, uh, we also have something called structured concurrency. Um, so structured concurrency is an approach uh, where the lifetime of, of the threads you create is determined by the syntactic structure of the code. So the idea here is that just by looking at the syntax as at the text of your method, you can understand how long these threads uh, will actually live and when they will terminate. So let's look at an example. So here we have a re-implementation of the power method um, using structured concurrency. <clears throat> so we got two computations, we fork two computations uh, with the same uh, with the same logic. So actually, first, what we do uh, in number one, we start a scope. So this the scope determines the syntactical boundary of how long any thread started within the scope will actually uh, live. So then we start two forks. The fork method can only be called within a, a scope, and that is checked at compile time. We are using context functions here from uh, Scala three. Um, and then we block uh, until the both forks are done. So when this uh, supervised scope exits, we can be sure that any forks started within have finished uh, either correctly or with an error. But we are sure that there are no thread uh, leaks. Um, and as an example of what happens when there's uh, an error, so if the forks fail with an exception, um, so the moment the second fork throw, uh, throws an exception, uh, the scope detects that a fork uh, has ended with an error. It interrupts all other running forks, and once all other forks and once all forks have finished, the exception is being rethrown. So again, uh, no thread leaks. Uh, finally, we've got channels to communicate between um, between forks between threads. So uh, what we are doing in, the, in this example, uh, a channel is a data structure quite similar to a queue. So we are creating a buffer channel with the capacity of five. So the sixth send will actually block, given that there are no uh, receives. Blocking is completely fine uh, because we are using virtual threads, right? So what once was actually forbidden in Scala, you cannot block a thread, now it's allowed. Because we are using virtual threads, you can create as many virtual threads as you want. Uh, so then what we do in, uh, from uh, two onwards is we create a fork, uh, so a background virtual thread, which will read lines from standard input, 
if the user input's done, then we say that the channel is done as well. So uh, being able to complete a channel successful or with an error is one of the features of channels that make them distinct uh, from a queue. And in the main body of the method, uh, we receive from the channel and we can do some expensive processing as long as the channel is not done. So when the channel is done, the whole supervised scope will exit and the fork will be uh, interrupted. So that's just a very simple example of how you might use channels to communicate between forks. And actually that's the low level interface. The high level interface is uh, resembles what you might know from reactive streaming libraries such as Akka streams, Zio streams or FS2. Um, here uh, we also operate on channels, but that's kind of hidden. So this, uh, there's a significant difference in that in the reactive stream implementations, you first create a description of your pipeline, of your streaming pipeline, and only later run it, right? Um, and that is called cold streams. Um, and here we've got hot streams. So the moment we call iterate, the moment we call transform, uh, the operation already starts uh, processing the elements. So each... Uh, each method such as iterate.transform creates a new virtual thread which runs these operations in the background, right? So source.iterate actually creates a new virtual thread which will produce consecutive natural numbers on the channel which is returned as a result. Transform takes, and, uh, takes a channel, uh, applies the transformations to these elements and anything that's uh, produced by these transformations will be produced to the return channel. And then we've got a for each blocking operation which consumes each element of the channel in a blocking uh, way. Okay, so there's a couple more things that are that's available in, in Ox, which I don't have time to, to demo here. All of these are uh, quite, uh, quite uh, explained, quite well explained in the documentation. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have seen error handling using untyped exceptions. It's also possible to do typed uh, typed errors using either's. So we are providing some utilities to work with that, along with the boundary break implementation. Um, we've got uh, retries, uh, so that you can retry operations in, in flexible ways. Um, Channels support a select operation, again modeled after Go, which guarantees that given a list of clauses, exactly one of these clauses uh, will complete. So that's very useful, especially when working with callbacks or, uh, or other channel transformations. We've got the actor pattern, various direct style utilities. Uh, there's some utilities to work with resources in a safe way, so we can attach a resource to a scope, which will guarantee that the resource will be released. Um, finally, we've got a kind of an experimental feature, a compiler plugin, which allows you to annotate uh, at compile time, annotate any low-level I.O. operations, and uh, then the I.O. capability has to pop up, and you get kind of a richer type signatures, which say uh, when a given method actually performs I.O. or not. Um, but a question that very often comes up and is actually motivated the design of Ox is how does this approach compare to functional effect systems, right? How does it, this compare to Cat's effect or uh, Zion? Right, so let's, uh, let's compare them in a couple of categories. So first we've got the basics over here, right? So a weakness of functional effect systems is that there's a lot of syntax overheads, right? Uh, you compose your programs using different syntax than uh, well, comparing to like normal programming, right? So you've got these maps, flat maps for comprehensions, um, and in the usual style, in the, in, the, in the direct style, you simply have a list of instructions separated by semicolons, which are sometimes invisible. Um, also, the stack traces are not that useful, uh, right? Uh, they, lack, they often lack important details, which makes uh, debugging uh, much harder. Um, you also often need custom control flow methods, so you cannot use the built-in ifs, for loops, and so on. Um, in direct style, all of these things are fixed, right? We can use, uh, we don't have the syntax overhead, we don't get any function coloring, uh, we've got useful stack traces, we can use the built-in control flow constructs. On the other hand, there are some bad sides, of course, as well, right? In direct style, we don't get the referential transparency, which might be very useful, for example, when refactoring, which we, which is like a core feature of functional uh, effect uh, systems. 
Okay. Also, error handling in the functional effects systems is built from the ground up. And it's done even a uh, very uh, clean and uh, it's simply well done. Here we have to use untyped exceptions or typed either's, which uh, I think is okay, but it's not perfect. Uh, so second, we've got various aspects of concurrency. So we saw that we have both the high level concurrency operators very similar to what we have in the function effect systems. We have the low-level concurrency. Uh, we have supervision in direct style. We have it through structured concurrency. In cuts effect to Zio, you can do it as well. It's By default, it's only one way. So if the child dies, the parent is not notified, but the other way around it works. You can do it the other way, but you need some extra uh, plumbing. Uh, once again, interruptions, something that is very well done in uh, functional effect systems, uh, because once again, it's built from the ground up in a principled way. It uses an out of bound channel to actually signal the interruptions. Um, here, we have to use the JVM mechanism of injecting an, an interrupted exception, which might be error prone because the exception can be caught and ignored. Um, and finally, we've got uh, some other aspects that, that we uh, can compare as well. So for example, in the uh, functional style, by default, uh, always everything is lazy, right? Which is uh, a nice property because we ha you have a single way of representing effectful code. Mm. In the direct approach, by default, everything is eager. However, sometimes you do need to provide the laziness manually, right? So uh, sometimes you do need uh, to specialize your code in a, uh, to be eager or lazy evaluated. Uh, the uh, ecosystem isn't that well developed in the direct style yet, at least when it comes to Scala, but I guess it's just a matter of time. And finally, uh, resource safety is something, once again, that is very well done in functional effect systems in a principled way, built from the ground up. Um, in direct style, while it's possible to use re resources safely, the compiler will not warn you if you try to do it unsafely, right? So we, you, there's like an escape hatch, which uh, which uh, um, will cause you that if you try to use a resource, the compiler won't complain. And that, that's because there's no like dedicated data type for resources, right? We only have closables. Um, so in, in the functional effects, as long as you don't leave uh, the functional effect land, you're actually, you're actually safe. Um, finally, we've got like a broad category of developer experience. So I guess that's a bit debatable, but I would say that, you know, if you uh, take into account the, the syntax overhead, the debuggability, um, and the approach being simply different to normal programming, the developer experience is slightly worse than in the direct style, which I guess it's easier to get introduced to. So to sum up, uh, what we gain is a simpler, simpler syntax, a lower learning curve. I would argue that better readability of the code, as we don't have the syntactic no noise of all the uh, monads and so on, and better, debug uh, and better debugability. We retain the concurrency and supervision features uh, that we know and love from functional effects systems. What we partially lose, however, is uh, the principled errors, interruption, and resource Im implementation. So all of these are somehow uh, done and they work quite well in direct style, but they are not as polished as in functional effects systems because of the baggage that we have to carry over from, from, uh, from the JVM. And finally, we lose referential transparency. So if you want to direct style, you have to live without referential transparency. Um, so I would... I uh, encourage you to give Ox a try. Uh, there's a couple of publicly available releases. It's Apache to license. It's on GitHub. So if you like the project, uh, please, uh, please start it. We are looking for feedback. We are also looking for cases where Ox actually works, works worse than functional effect systems so that we can you know, either fix something in Ox uh, or maybe simply let the users know that for this use case, don't use direct style. Um, and to finish off, I would like to take my company, which um, make, made this trip uh, possible. So just a few words about SoftWare. We are a consulting company. We try to solve 
hard problems that our clients face using uh, software, and if services such as migrating Scala projects, or introducing Java 21, um, or doing Kafka consulting, or generally uh, software development would be of interest to you, I would be happy uh, to chat. Uh, and, this, and with that, that's all I have. Um, I also have 10 Tapirs. Uh, we are also working on the Tapir library, which is like an HTTP uh, library. Maybe you know it. If you don't know it, also take a look. I brought 10 Tapir mascots. They are standing over here. So if you'd like one, please take uh, take them after, after the talk. I don't want to fly back with them uh, to Poland. So, um, so yeah, that's all I had. Thank you very much for your time. えー、アダムさんありがとうございました。それでは、OK。質疑応答に移りたいと思います。質問がある方いらっしゃいますでしょうか。はい。あ。あ。Hello okay. Adam, thank you for the talk. Uh on the topic of readability, uh is it possible from the signature of the function alone to determine whether or not the function is using aux under the hood, or is it wouldn't be unclear? Is it using what? Sorry, uh, the the library, the aux. Ah, uh, no, no, it's not. I mean, uh, okay, so we've got this uh, over here. We've got this I/O, which mm -hmm. uh, is a marker, uh, which says that this method performs. IO, right? However, it's still kind of an experimental feature, which uh, I would especially like to get some feedback on. Uh, so of course, if you have IO in the signature, then of course, you know that you are using aux under the hood, right? But otherwise, if you, for example, use, uh, let's say, a par over here, right? That's like, a, it's, an, it's kind of an implementation detail of result that parallelism is used inside. Because if you just run computation one, uh, semicolon comp computational two, the method will behave exactly the same, save for it will take a longer amount of time, right? But the errors will be the same uh, and the result will be the same as well, right? So, uh, so if you just use these concurrency or even the structures concurrency, that's also like, a, that's also like a, uh, an implementation detail. So if you just use these, it's you can't really tell from the signature that uh, anything is happening. Yeah. So uh, actually, an important uh, thing here is that there's this gears library that I mentioned uh, from EPFL, and it's making a different design choice. So uh, it also wants to track uh, suspensions. So uh, here we have an I.O. capability, which says that this method might perform I.O., right? So uh, anytime a method performs I.O., the idea is that you have to add a using I.O. Uh, type parameter. And in Gears, they also have another capability. Well, that's the only capability they have, in fact, which is async, which says this method might block. So now whether uh, tracking asynchronous suspensions is really interesting or not, I'm not certain yet. We might introduce like an async capability as well, but that's also what I'm trying to like find out. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I, I wanted to ask about the race uh, method where you had like two computations returning the same type. I was wondering whether there is also like an uh, overloaded method or, uh, which can also work with uh, multiple types and more than two computations and how you represent the return type yeah, so uh, yeah, there's a variant which just takes a list of computations, sure. And in this, if, if in the variant that takes a list, you actually need to uh, uh, you need to provide them as tanks, so you know they, they, so that they can be evaluated later. The return type is simply the least upper bound of the types. So if it was an int string, you in Scala three you could just have an int or string, right? A union type. Yes. Yes. Correct. Uh, what about Scala two? Oh, this doesn't work. No, that's Scala 3 only. Okay, okay. So, okay, yeah, Ox is a Scala 3 only library. 
Uh, because, for example, we are using a context functions over here, right? To make sure that fork can only be started within a scope that I don't know how to do it in Scala. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's possible. Yeah. Okay, okay, understood. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks for the questions. Hi, uh, so in Scala 2, the, using the classic futures, they all take like this execution context thing, which is often kind of handy, like in passing a single thread the execution context for deterministic evaluation. You can like, limit the parallelism to like, unparallelism of eight because I don't want to like maybe use too many cores or don't want to overload the backend server. Um, I see you don't have anything equivalent that I could see. Is there some way to configure this using aux? Uh, no, so okay, so the execution context has two sides, I think. Uh, it's usually actually quite annoying that you have to pass around EC execution context everywhere. So, but yes, as you say, it's also, it can be considered a bug in the feature that you cannot actually substitute it. Uh, so here we always use virtual threads, which really doesn't make sense. Well, you can configure the base thread pool maybe, but we didn't get to that stage yet. You know? So uh, yeah, it might, it might make sense to provide the the base career thread or the platform thread pool uh, as a conf as configuration. It's not yet available, should be quite easy to do. Uh, but by default, we just start the virtual threads. So uh, there's you know no context actually to pass around. So you couldn't do tricks like, or things like uh, passing a single thread at one to get determinism. So that's not, that wouldn't be possible now. Thank you very much. Thank you to the translators and to the organizers for a great conference. And uh, please take the top years. Thank you. <laughs>